for ESL webinar uh, sponsored by uh, IPSA. This time on penile size dissatisfaction from physiology to management. And first of all, I'd like to give the word to our scientific chair, Giovanni Corona. Thank you, Mikkel. Uh, this is another very important webinar with a very interesting topic uh, covering uh, several aspects, including endocrinology, surgery, and psychological impact. I think we need to thank uh, IPSA for supporting all of these webinars. So it is my pleasure to invite our president, uh, Professor Carlo Bettocchi. Thank you very much, Giovanni, and uh, good evening, everybody. I think uh, it's very nice uh, to keep uh, be uh, in touch with one each other and uh, proposing from our side topics that we believe are really very debating. And uh, I think that uh, you will enjoy today because, as Giovanni said, we have a lot of things to say about this very interesting topic. But uh, I think I need to thank the uh, same way, really, Ibsa, because uh, uh, we did start a few years ago a very good and strong collaboration uh, scientifically and uh, in terms of education. And uh, as you can see you now, we will have uh, another webinar very soon on the 5th of October. And uh, I think that uh, you really need to stay tuned with us. And for all of these uh, collaborations, next please, I need to thank uh, both of these two people that uh, uh, if we move on the next slides, yeah. Those are the guys that really are aiming uh, all of the educational and scientific uh, context of our society. And so really from the bottom of my heart, thank you very much, Mikel and Giovanni for everything you are doing uh, since I'm the president, but also before. Um, if we move on, uh, I think I need to say a few words about our uh, uh, projects and educational things. Uh, I'm very proud to tell you that we are really very, very close to start our uh, ESSM Academy on genital surgery and uh, uh, everything will start really in a couple of months. And as you can see, we have designed a very interesting uh, hands-on training program with three levels. Uh, the first level will be on uh, with an online uh, webinars that will be uh, distributed in October, November, and December this year. Then we will move on a textbook and video library uh, level. And this is very interesting because we did write and we did prepare a book on uh, really surgery on uh, genitalia. And also we have done a lot of uh, videos that uh, people can really see. And then for people that will then join the last level, the third level, there will be a very interesting uh, program, surgical program, first of all, with 3D models. And then we will move on a fellowship in our uh, center of excellence. They are really everywhere in Europe and they are very well known from, for everybody. So this is already starting and we did start uh, some month ago, also this other very interesting educational project. This is a scientific uh, collaboration and partnership that we set up. Basically, the idea was to connect the uh, most important sexual medicine expert from all different uh, sexual societies with our young talent authors in order to be able to grow up and to be able to start to write and to be involved in a scientific project. And we have already finalized one paper, but other two are running. And so I think we are very happy because this is another good way to get the young people more and more involved in our society. Next, please. Uh, this is the school. The school is uh, definitely one of our best uh, projects uh, since. And uh, you know that unfortunately we need to pass one year without doing it just because of the COVID pandemic. Uh, but we are ready to start again now in uh, November 2022. Uh, both the ESSM school and the advanced course, course on sexual medicine. So uh, people, I think, know very well this project and all the information are uh, fully uh, um, written in our website. Next, please. Uh, this is another important uh, thing that we are running since 10 years and is our certification exam. You know that 
we have done this uh, uh, in cooperation with EFS, with the uh, multiple joint committee of sexual medicine. And uh, if you want to become a fellow uh, for the uh, European Committee of Sexual Medicine, and now the deadline is very soon, it's on the 30th of September. So keep moving on uh, doing your application. And uh, uh, there is another deadline for people that are on the psychosexologist field and the line is on the 15th of October. And so this is very important because then you have the possibility to do uh, the, uh, the exam in Rotterdam, although is an online format, but is on February 12, 2022. Next, please. Last slides for me is just to remind you that uh, we are uh, already uh, finishing and finalizing our physical congress. So we will come back on physical congress, hopefully in uh, February 17, 19 uh, next year. And the meeting will be in Rotterdam and Kobe will be the chairman uh, of the meeting. So I'm sure that uh, this will be a very, very interesting meeting, not only because we will come back and see one each other, but also because the program is really very nice as usual. And so really start to organize your trip and uh, I hope to see you physically really very soon. So I think that now, Mikkel, if you want just to present the, the session, I would be pleased. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carlo. Uh, yeah, now moving on to the night's main event. Uh, very excited to present the webinar on penile size dissatisfaction. And we have three uh, tonight very, very accomplished uh, speakers and experts to guide us through this. Dr. Rastrelli is an endocrinologist and associate professor at the University of Florence and really an extremely accomplished researcher with about 200 scientific uh, um, publications. Our second speaker, uh, Dr. Pascal, is uh, a psychologist and assistant professor in Lisbon, Portugal, focusing her research on sexual medicine and really also a true expert in, in this field. So this will be exciting. And of course, our last speaker needs no presentation. In this context, our ESSM president, Carlo Bitaki. So please enjoy the webinar, everybody. And if you have questions throughout the webinar, put them in the Q&A or the chat, and we'll collect as many as possible and answer them at the end of the webinar. So thank you. So I uh, start thanking the, organ the organization for inviting me in this uh, webinar and IPSA for supporting this interesting uh, webinar. And uh, let's pass to talk uh, about the male external genitalia development. This uh, um, a process starting uh, at week six of gestation when uh, indifferentiated genitalia start uh, becoming male external genitalia upon the um, action of the hydrotestosterone, which act uh, as a, a promoter of differentiation. In this phase of gestation until week 12, um, the hypothalamic uh, pituitary testicular axis is is not active and all the process is stimulated by placental ACG, uh, chorionic gonadotropin. Uh, after week 12, the differentiation of male external genitalia is almost complete and the stimulation uh, by DHT that is now um, driven by GnRH and LH stimulation is um, aimed at growth. So the differentiation is complete and during this period, uh, male external genitalia uh, grow, uh, including uh, um, the penis. Uh, micropenis is defined as a normally formed penis with a stretched penile length shorter than 2.5 standard deviation than the mean for patient's age. This is a table reporting normal uh, values uh, at different ages that calculated for you the uh, lower limit of uh, penile length for uh, um, term newborn and for adults. And micropenis may be isolated 
related or combined with uh, other uh, defects of uh, um, male uh, genital tract, including uh, uh, scrotum bifidus or cryptorchidism, which are uh, all part of, uh, disorder of the dis <coughs> disorders of sexual uh, differentiation. And, but uh, it is important that micropenis is, uh, is differentiated by clitoromegaly. And this is uh, quite a challenging task because uh, both micropenis and clitoromegaly are um, intermediate uh, stages of uh, a continuum spectrum of differentiation spanning from normal female external genitalia to normal male uh, genitalia. And it is quite difficult to uh, differentiate differentiate these two conditions so when uh, approaching a newborn with uh, micropenis, uh, it is mandatory to check for its uh, his, uh, his or her karyotype uh, because uh, we are um, we try to differentiate disorders of sexual development uh, occurring in a newborn with a normal um, female karyotype and exposed to an androgen excess to um, disorders of sexual uh, development occurring in uh, newborns with uh, uh, male normal karyotype but exposed to an androgen deficiency. In addition, micropenis may occur in uh, sex chromosome uh, aneuploidy in uh, uh, syndromic conditions as part of complex uh, uh, multiple malformation uh, um, multiple malformations and it may be also idiopathic. Uh, androgen deficiency is the pathogenic basis of uh, um, almost uh, all uh, uh, micropenis and uh, androgen deficiency of the fetus, uh, which is also uh, called very uh, early onset hypogonadism, may occur from a large series of conditions which are uh, here uh, summarized in these clusters. And uh, the ones that are now disappearing and becoming gray are conditions uh, um, which are characterized by a very, very early onset of uh, androgen deficiency, uh, most likely occurring uh, um, since uh, and before uh, the uh, six uh, um, week of gestation. So it is likely that these conditions um, are associated with a micropenis occurring with with other um, defects of male genital tract. Um, on the contrary, uh, the other uh, conditions here reported in uh, uh, black are conditions that can occur in different uh, um, phases of gestation, and uh, in particular, hypothalamus pituitary defects are, um, by definition, um, creates their consequences after the week 12 of gestation. Th uh, thus, this condition are most likely um, uh, causes of, uh, my, of uh, uh, micropenis isolated without other um, defects. Uh, the androgen uh, dependence of penile um, of, uh, of penile length is uh, uh, and well uh, well apparent and it is uh, well uh, described by this study, uh, including 124 uh, healthy term male newborns. In uh, these uh, children, in these neonates, uh, the um, stretched penile length is significant significantly uh, associated, positively associated with the total testosterone measured in the first 72 hours in, of postnatal life. So in children, um, penile length is dependent upon uh, serum testosterone levels. And now uh, this is the first question for you. Uh, what is the gestational, uh, um, gestational period when androgen deficiency most likely occurred in a newborn with isolated micropenis? Uh, one, during the first trimester, two, at the beginning of the third trimester, three, after the end of the first trimester, or four, after birth. So please vote. We will leave another few seconds for everybody to vote and then I will close the poll and share the results so that we can all see.
Okay, so uh, most, uh, the, the, most of you voted for the first, but we have a lot of votes also for the third. And the, um, the third one is the right one because uh, isolated micropenis uh, uh, is a, a typical characteristic of hypogonadism occurring after the 12 uh, week of gestation. So uh, move on to uh, the treatment, so what we can do for uh, children with uh, micropenis. Well, it is important to underline that uh, this is a field uh, of medicine uh, that, is, uh, um, that lacks of robust evidence because we do not have randomized clinical trials on this topic. And most of the knowledge is based on uncontrolled and uh, uh, small trials. So we are treating uh, this patient uh, uh, on this basis. And uh, the most uh, uh, used uh, regimens are based on uh, um, different androgens. So the first one is the intramuscular testosterone enantate, 25 uh, milligrams uh, once a month for three months. And this is a, a very small uh, study showing that uh, um, that uh, this treatment is able to improve penile length and to um, and to reverse and to uh, uh, reverse micropenis because uh, the standard deviation is no longer um, is no longer in the range of the micropenis definition as you can see and this is uh, um, beneficial uh, both uh, when uh, when the treatment is uh, uh, given uh, in children uh, younger than two years but also when is provided in older, in later in childhood. Another possible uh, um, treatment is based in, on uh, human chronic gonadotropin uh, given intramuscularly once per week for six weeks. This is, this is a study uh, on uh, 25 children and 14 of these were treated uh, with, uh, with uh, um, chorionic gonadotropin, the, uh, those older than 11 years. And as you can see, uh, the penile length after eight weeks of treatment was significantly uh, improved in these uh, children. Another approach is based on um, topical uh, treatment. It is um, using uh, DHT, transdermal gel, 12.5 uh, milligram or 25 milligram daily for eight weeks in um, children younger or older than 10 years, respectively. In this study, um, including 22 patients with micropenis, uh, the treatment was able to improve penile length and normalize this uh, almost in all cases. But what about uh, uh, the treatment during adulthood? What we can say to uh, patients uh, uh, coming for uh, micropenis uh, during the adulthood? It is important to underline that uh, micropenis in adults is a quite uncommon, is, is a very uncommon uh, condition. And most, in most cases, we are dealing with constitutional small penis and the discomfort and the distress, the dissatisfaction that this um, creates uh, in the patient. So we are not uh, generally uh, or rarely, we are not we, we rarely deal with a, um, an organic condition. But um, how, how we can manage these patients. And this is the question number two. When small penis is a concern in an adult subject, one, an attempt of androgen therapy should be uh, done. Two, at puberty, small, uh, small penis is spontaneously corrected in subject without effects of the gonadal axis. So further androgen therapy is not useful. Uh, three, local androgen therapy, for example, DHT gel is not effective, but only injectable T therapy can be used. Or four, androgen therapy can be used only after surgery. So please vote. Thank you so much. I see a lot of people are taking part to the pool. So let's just wait a few seconds more yeah. so that we collect as many as possible.
thank you very much. I'm about to close the poll and share the results. Okay, thank you for voting. I see uh, that most of you voted for the second one, a lot also for the first one. So the um, opposite uh, um, um, answers, but uh, the, um, the right one is the second one. And I I'm going to show you uh, the reason. Uh, this is a study performed on 27 boys visited for a small penis and without any chromosomal abnormalities or other genital, genital disorders. They were visited during early childhood and then followed up during the pubertal development from the beginning to the completion of pubertal development. A part of them were treated with androgens for a small penis, the green line, whereas uh, uh, the other part were, uh, remained untreated, the blue line. As you can see, during the pubertal development, the um, penis uh, developed and uh, increased its length uh, in a very, very, very similar uh, trend uh, in a treated and untreated subject. And the increase in uh, stretched penine length was comparable in subject who received or not the uh, treatment during childhood. Uh, in addition, the, um, the uh, increase in penile length was uh, uh, greater as uh, uh, in subject that uh, had the shorter penis at base. And so the recovery uh, was uh, evident in uh, also in uh, those that had the shorter penis at the beginning uh, of their uh, life. And uh, um, this, this uh, suggests that uh, androgens uh, can be, um, are, are not so essential for the treatment uh, in, uh, in children because Puberty with its uh, uh, increase in uh, androgens uh, is enough for uh, uh, correcting the condition. And, uh, um, but what about uh, in adults uh, when uh, puberty is completed? Well, uh, randomized clinical trials uh, uh, comparing testosterone treatment with placebo does not, uh, do not show any change in penile uh, um, in penile length. And uh, the reason is reported here uh, by this study, uh, evaluating uh, autopsy of uh, 63 uh, male adults uh, and showing that uh, penile dimension, so flaxseed or stretched length or circ circumference is not associated with uh, serum testosterone levels. That's showing in contrast with childhood that penile length is no longer responsive or associated with androgen levels uh, uh, during uh, adulthood. Uh, so in uh, uh, conclusion, micropenis is a rare condition found at birth or in the early infancy. It may be a clinical manifestation of certain forms of congenital hypogonadism. However, the diagnosis of hypogonadism in childhood uh, when uh, the hypothalamic testicular axis uh, is inactive is very difficult and pending a precise diagnosis, androgen therapy may be useful in children for improving the penile length with uh, limited adverse events, even though the studies are uncontrolled, so very low quality evidence. However, long-term follow-up data show that the improvement is obtained at puberty in subjects not treated during childhood. An improvement is spontaneous or a poor androgen treatment if required because a hypogonadal condition emerged. Uh, after the pubertal development is complete, penile length is no longer androgen dependent and testosterone therapy does not affect the penile di <coughs> dimensions. And testosterone therapy should not be used in adults with complete pubertal development complaining about small penis. And I thank you for the attention.
Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Patricia Pasqual. Um, I'm going to start my presentation now. And before starting, of course, I want to thank IPSA, but mostly ESSM for um, making this initiative possible and by building up such a beautiful series of webinars with such serious and important issues. Um, I'm not going to focus on my opinion, so let's change to something completely different, but still connected. I'm focusing on penile size dissatisfaction that might make some men look for help um, um, close to physicians, um, but may not be related to the existence of a micropenis. And um, to, um, I want to share with you what um, my, I'm having problems with, uh, with the formatting, I'm sorry. Um, and to, I'm just doing this again. Okay. I just want to tell you what, yeah, I don't seem I can, it doesn't seem like I can change this. Um, well, I just wanted to tell you what my speaking position is, because I think it's very important um, if I share with you what is my background, because it in somehow it shapes what I say, and it also might show you what, where do my ideas come from. Um, so let me see if this doesn't happen again. Okay, so I'm a clinical psychologist, and I was trained what is called a cognitive behavioral um, framework. I worked full-time 10 years in a public mental health settings, not doing research, anything, just working as a clinician, and I think a lot of you might relate to that. I meanwhile became a researcher and assistant professor in Lisbon, which is the capital city of Portugal, and I'm a white middle-aged cis woman. So take this into consideration because a lot of what I, I, I will say comes from my clinical practice and also from my research. So talking about penis size dissatisfaction. As I told you before, this might not be rooted in the actual existence of a micro penis or of a huge penis. It is shaped, this experience of dissatisfaction is shaped by culture, by relationships, by personal vulnerability, and of course, by anatomy. And these factors may change over time as we develop, we grow, and um, our vulnerabilities and the way the culture impacts us change too, and we build up on our relationships. So penis size from a cultural perspective, and I have to admit, I'm looking at the phenomena from a Western, highly industrialized country with a certain tradition of what is called a macho, a Latino, macho Latino complex. And in Europe and in Latin cultures, uh, the big phallus was actually from ancient times and ancient Greece. And you can find phallic urns there. It's a, a painting from phallic urns. It was very related to reproduction. It was a symbol portraying big penis. It was a symbol for fertility. Okay. And meanwhile, historically, also in Western society, we have built on the idea that a big penis is necessary for female sexual satisfaction, that it's actually a condition, um, I would say a necessary condition, a core condition for women to experience satisfaction and satisfaction in the shape of orgasm, in the shape of pleasure. So this is a bit of the historical um, context. But nowadays we can say that our society is, focus, is focusing a lot on success and on the objectification of bodies. Summing up, your body appearance is related to the level of success you achieve and to your value. So the more beautiful, the younger, et cetera, you look, the more probabilities, the odds of having a successful career and the more valuable you are. Also, we find, and this is of course, generalized to every bit of your body, your hair, your lips, your breasts, penis, et cetera. We also find a lot of subliminal messages in commercials playing around, making jokes, innuendos about how pleasurable and how necessary a big phallus is. 
I was watching Fight Club recently, um, and I didn't, I didn't remember this part of the film, but as I was seeing it again, uh, there is a part that the character played by Brad Pitt um, um, put some small bits of big penises in old film while he's passing films on the cinema. And the people, just they don't really understand it. They think this was something. So this is what commercials are doing. Commercials are sending you subliminal messages and portraying uh, big phallus and big penis. And we are, you know, of course, integrating this information because we are integrating information all the time. We also have the phenomena of dick pics. That is, these are being sent uh, unwillingly or willingly to people. There are dick pics being sent to people who didn't want to receive them, and this is a form of cyberbullying. But there is also trade of dick pics, for instance, in applications like Grinder, or, or even in Tinder, in heterosexual, gay men with sex with men context. And nowadays, we also have easier access to porn. And women, too, they have um, easier access to porn to see and to constantly be exposed when they choose, of course, that, that kind of genre, um, big penises. So I would also add that there has been a democratization of appearance concern to male in all age frames. This means that appearance concerns and due to these objectification and self-objectification of bodies and um, basically um, has turned into men being worried about their looks from a small age to an old age. This used to be uh, more of a focus of concern for women and of course it is shaped in different ways for women but it's a concern for men too and for young men too. And of course there are some commercial interests in promoting the idea that you need a, a better penis, a huge penis in order to be a more valuable man. Summing up, and I'm calling back to ob objectification and self-objectification theory, we can say that if you are your body is constantly objectified, or in this case male bodies are objectified in so many different ways that have, as I have just told you. And a person internalizes this idea that is worth, is dependent on, on the appearance, this might translate into a genital focus and to a concern uh, with penis size. Okay, so what I'm trying to argue here is that there are well-studied cultural factors that contribute in vulnerable men for the experience of dissatisfaction with their penis. There are also some relationship factors. When a partner or the partners the person is involved with is very focused on the size of the penis or the partner's perception of the size of the penis. Um, it's different. One thing is to say, I like the size of the penis. I think that the penis is important or the size. Another thing is, I have an idea that you might be above or below average, whatever. And of course, the existence of relationship conflict. And the, one of the characteristics of relationship conflicts is when there is a fight, people say whatever they want. And it's a well-known weapon to be used by people as that you don't even satisfy me sexually which is perceived very often as, oh my God, my penis is not big enough. Um, I'm going to now talk about what is very important in, this, in a psychological or mental health perspective, which are the individual characteristics. So we know that body mass index actually has a, a role on the way men perceive their penis. So men with huger figure, more volume, tend to perceive their penis as a smaller, it's a contrast effect. Um, also, we know that men who have sex with men might have a, a perception that their penis is smaller, but they also might be more prone to do correction to the penis size using different methods. Um, Perception of penis size doesn't mean that all men are worried that their penis is small. And it's very interesting that literature shows that even men who perceive their penis as being, you know, average are still dissatisfied. So it's actually a quest 
for the big penis. And I'm focusing mostly on the most common phenomenon that these men who are dissatisfied because they want a huge penis, but it can also happen that a man is dissatisfied, of course, because he needs or he wants a smaller penis. Um, okay, one important aspect is the obsessive traits. It can be a personality a disorder or not. It's just a characteristic of the person. And obsessive traits translate into being, thinking, thinking, and rethinking about, I should do something about it. It's not working well. This is not the right size, you know. Doing this repeatedly, it puts you in a very bad mood. It makes your mood go really down, and it, it, it's a very, very, very common factor that contributes for emotional adjustment is rumination, worry about specific aspects going over and over again. And of course, if there is a global focus on performance, and there are a lot of men that are culturally um, socialized to um, be focusing on their performance at various levels. Of course, I think nowadays men and women are non-binary people. We are all um, in a way trained to um, perform and to have success, but this doesn't help if you're in, for your sexual satisfaction or sexual, um, um, your sexual pleasure and your happiness. And also have to take into account that certain psychopathological expressions might translate into penis size dissatisfaction. And I'm talking about, for example, body dysmorphic disorder, but it can also be penis size anxiety. So why is this relevant? And this is you know, one of the major contributions that psychology has um, um, given to the field, and this comes from a cognitive um, frame, theoretical frame, is that if, and I'm translating the model from left to right now, if you think appearance is very important, if you think a man should please his partner or his partners, men or women or binary, but it, you know, I have to satisfy my partner using my um, huge and such a good performer penis. And if I'm really dissatisfied with my body and with my, my penis, what will happen probably is during sexual activity, the attention of this person is going to be on my penis. How is it performing? Is it full? Is it not full? Is it big? Oh, it's not in its full potential. It could be bigger, you know? And this focus on penis size might translate into a distressful sexual response, into the experience of erectile dysfunction or even um, dissatisfaction. Okay. Let me just tell you that this is not only about penis. Okay, when we talk about body appearance, cognitive distraction, and you can find a study we developed some years ago, published in GSM, we actually found that belly is the one of the major concerns, but penis size is also one of the major concerns. Okay, so clinical implications, and I'm really approaching the end of my communication. As has, as has appearance concern as a trait. Okay, just try to see in your clinical settings if this uh, concern with the penis size is part of a broader concern and focus on appearance. Consider sexual beliefs. How rooted are these ideas that a man has to have a big, big penis in order to satisfy a partner? And I rephrase it again. This is not only in heterosexual relationships. Okay. This happens with men involved in all kinds of relationship structures and with all kinds of sexual identities and bodies. And this idea that I have to please with my big penis. Also, assess anatomy, of course, but also the perception. Because you might be dealing with somebody, you, you, you say to this person, oh, this is a completely normal, average penis size. Um, there's nothing I can do for you, it's not ethical, whatever, but this person might be, no, 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 yeah, it's average, but it's not enough, might be, this perception might be completely different, okay, also evaluate if this cognitive distraction during sexual activity takes place, and is um, being detrimental for sexual response, but also for sexual satisfaction, and for the perception of one's um, and performance, Evaluate, of course, mental health, you know, like what I've just told you about this morphic disorder, penis size anxiety, etc. And evaluate the meaning. Why is this important for you? What, what does it mean 
to have um, a bigger or smaller penises. We know we know that men with a big penis might have um, partners who feel pain due to the penis size. Let's let's see what what are people thinking? Do they think that by changing the size of the penis, everything is going to disappear, the conflicts, everything? Let's let's evaluate meaning, a personal meaning and relationship meaning. I think we need to really focus on relationships. Work with expectations, expectations about clinical management of micropenis or of penis size dissatisfaction, and refer when you suspect that there might be some anxiety, personality, or mental health issues. I thank you for your kind attention, and I'm willing to answer your question. Thank you so much, Patricia. Okay, it's my time now to give you my talk. Okay. I think it's coming. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, I think really it's a little bit of time to say some words about the surgical management. Uh, but before I get inside uh, this uh, point, uh, just want to uh, remind and really remark some of the concept that has been already discussed and presented by the other two excellent uh, speakers. First of all, when we are talking about male genital image, we know that this is very much correlated to the overall body image and the psychosocial variables and also the sexual health. Uh, among the motivations for seeking a surgical procedure, the most frequently uh, cited by our patients are the psychological discomfort in uh, the homosocial situations or also towards uh, women. And almost always this is linked uh, to the perception that genital size is uh, or are incoherent with their body. And so uh, we know that 91% of men perceive their penis to be smaller than average, but uh, most of them don't really need treatment. And so who really needs the treatment? We have already uh, seen these, uh, some of these numbers, uh, these uh, very interesting papers published on the BJU International in 2011, basically where they were establishing a sort of reference range for penal length in the British uh, population and was a prospective study in more than 600 people. And the mean pendulous length was uh, 8.7 centimeters, whether the uh, stretch length was 14.3. But the important point is that uh, this is crucial, this paper, in order to understand the, uh, what can be defined as normal. And in fact, micropenis was defined as a penis that is at least 2.5 standard deviations smaller than the average penis. And so those are the numbers that we need to rely when we discuss in our consultation with our patients. Uh, and so we come back uh, again on this uh, important point that is the penal dysmorphophobia. Most of men who perceive their penis uh, smaller than average is affected by this, uh, um, this condition called penal dysmorphophobia that is uh, a part of body dysmorphic, dysmorphic disorder, um, which is a disorder that uh, is presented by a sort of preoccupation with an imaginary or trivial flow in the physical appearance. And those patients, uh, very often, they develop a major depression episodes and sometimes also some drastic social and occupational dysfunctions that might progress to a sort of social isolation. So it is very important really to consider these possible side effects. Uh, small penis syndrome can be considered as another important psychological aspect in this matter. People with small penis uh, do not have usually uh, a small penis, uh, but uh, uh, instead they are very much, uh, they have a, sev a very severe anxiety about the tail penis size. Uh, having a small penis uh, 
this is not really medical diagnosis, but uh, uh, sometimes uh, these people lead to a decreased quality of life. And <clears throat> this is important because there is a reflection also in the sexual life particularly. So what do we have in terms of treatment options? We have conservative and surgical options. In the conservative uh, colon, we have a vacuum or traction therapy, whether uh, we have some other option for surgery, surgery. And then I will come back later on to give you some infos about injection grafting, uh, penal lengthening, and corporoplastic phalloplasty. But let's start basically for the, from the conservative approach. Uh, vacuum erected devices, uh, uh, we have seen that uh, may temporarily increase the size of the penis by drawing blood into the corpora cavernosa. Uh, however, the ability to create a long-term lasting uh, change in penal length and girth is very much debated at the moment because uh, now in the papers that are in the literature, we have seen that there, are, there is no significant uh, length gain uh, reporting in the studies. We have only 11% of men who reporting uh, an achievement of one centimeter of length, uh, but the overall satisfaction uh, with this treatment was very poor, and these uh, make this treatment really option, not really uh, one of the best to be proposed. Uh, it's different if we discuss about uh, the pin attraction. Um, pin attraction device use the principle of continuous mechanical force transduction across uh, a sort of tissue plan to produce, uh, produce tissue remodeling. Uh, this is a uh, numbers uh, that you can see here, taken from a study of an Italian author, Gontero, who reported a length gain of 2.3 centimeters in the flatty state and 1.7 in the stretched phase. Uh, despite these uh, encouraging outcomes, um, we know that uh, uh, increases in penal girth were uh, clinically insignificant. And so basically we can offer this, uh, this uh, option if people is looking for uh, some kind of increase in uh, uh, penal length, but not uh, by sure for people who are seeking for increase in penal girth. Uh, what about, uh, let's move on uh, some kind of uh, surgical treatment and the more, the most easy one that is very much practiced overall in the world is the injection therapy. Uh, I want to start from uh, the, um, the sort of old fashioned treatment and the principle of uh, 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 fat injection basically include liposuction, fat harvest that is typically taken from the abdomen or thigh, uh, and then uh, the fat is prepared and then finally is injected uh, into the penis. Uh, well, the, the major problem uh, of this technique is the low sur survivability of the adipocytes and uh, this is important because uh, sometimes, although they are implanted in uh, highly vascularized tissue beds, uh, they, go, uh, in, they, they do have a, a sort of degradation with uh, possible necrosis of the fat. And sometimes these end up in a cosmetic complication and also functional deficit that may require some additional surgery to fix it. Uh, it's different if we use uh, the uh, tiny droplets of silicone. This is another old technique. Uh, reports of symptomatic uh, reaction to penal injection include uh, different kind of uh, pictures, something like edema, sometimes also penal distortion, uh, granuloma, sexual dysfunction. So all of these problem uh, where occur in uh, this technique that has been used in the last 30 years. Uh, different if we discuss about the new material and uh, hyaluronic acid is definitely uh, the, the most used now and uh, the one that is giving uh, best and safe results. Um, basically, uh, all patients usually have a good retention of girth gain in a longer also follow-up studies up to uh, two years uh, and there was no report on deformity. So this is very good because these were the main problems with the other technique, as I told you. But also here, sometimes we have problem in terms of vascular occlusion that may occur. 
and sometimes uh, these are caused by arterial embolization after the injection of the hyaluronic acid. Uh, different if we uh, talk about the PMMA, uh, we know that uh, this is a non-absorbable soft tissue filler that has been uh, used uh, because of the um, characteristic of its uh, permanence. Um, in fact, uh, the, if you see the results, uh, there was an increase, uh, an average increase in penal girth, uh, not only in the flaccid state, but uh, not sorry, not only in the stretched phase, but also in the flaccid one, probably due to the composition of this material. But uh, here we have uh, almost 50% of complications in terms of nodularity, indentation, uh, irregularity, ridge nodularity. And so all of these, uh, let's say, abnormal reaction will make really the patient really unhappy. Uh, but uh, the patient did use to inject uh, other things, and this is a nice picture taken from a paper published on Juno Sexual Medicine. And here you can see uh, a very bad uh, complication using silicone. Uh, the deformity uh, of the shaft of the penis and the scrotum was huge. And then you can see in the picture in the middle uh, the initial debridement. And finally, on the right side, uh, the scrotum was recomposed and closed. Uh, but uh, again, uh, the end result of this uh, in terms of cosmetic is very bad and the patient really became very unhappy. Uh, but this is even more uh, incredible. Uh, this is a case that I manage in my place, my hospital, and it was a, a, a man coming from the East Europe and he was injecting in the, the penis uh, in the shaft uh, a motor oil and he thought that this, uh, somebody told him that this was good to increase the girth of his penis. But as you can see, uh, the necrosis was huge. And so the uh, cosmetic results really was very bad. And he needed to be recomposed with some graft. Um, what about grafting? Grafting uh, is important because dermal, if you talk about a dermal uh, graft, well, um, free graft uh, use basically the de-epitheliaise dermis and the subcutaneous fat. Um, basically, the mean girth gain was about 2.3 centimeters. And the main complications of this technique include the prepucial uh, edema and the paraphimosis, uh, sometimes also pain during the erection. Uh, we can, I have to tell you that this is a surgical procedure, very complex and has a long time to be performed. So something usually more than three, four hours. And so uh, if you do not have a very good expertise in a microvascular technique, it's better not to start it because then it became too much uh, easy to get complications. It's different when you use the xenograft and there is a paper from, uh, from Italy uh, using uh, porcine dermal cerebral matrix graft. And uh, this paper gave very good results uh, with a significantly increase in both the flaccid and erect states from uh, before surgery to one year after surgery. And uh, the rate of satisfaction was even very, very high. Uh, and uh, it is important because a significant number of patients uh, experience uh, graft fibrosis. Uh, so again, this is another possible option to be offered. When we move into the more, uh, let's say, uh, typical technique that we usually offer to our patient, we need to move on ligament resection. Uh, the suspensor ligament is uh, usually composed by the suspensor ligament itself and the arcuate uh, subpubic, subpubic ligament that usually attach to the tunica albuginea in the midline uh, and to the pubic uh, symphysis. Uh, it is important because uh, it can be combined with some other techniques uh, such as the subcoronal approach, the zetaplasty and the vuiplasty. So let's see something about the inverted uh, vuiplastid. Uh, basically, uh, this is a, a quite a straightforward procedure is an incision, uh, as you can see here, that is made above the base of the penis. And through this, uh, we can release the penis suspensor ligament and then allow the penis to be brought forward and lengthening uh, externally in the flaccid states uh, 
in something that is to be almost between one to two centimeters. So this is the reasonable uh, expectation that we need to offer to our patients. Uh, what about suprapubic lipectomy? Uh, this is usually performed in combination with suspensor ligament release in patients that are affected by buried penis. Uh, this technique uh, has been performed to increase uh, perceived penal length, particularly uh, in these people, because uh, um, we know that in these patients, uh, the weight loss does not always uh, reduce the problem of a large uh, overhanging fold or the so-called Mons Panus. So what about the technique? The skin is removed uh, in a sort of trapezoid incision and the inferior portion of the incision is marked about two centimeters above the base of the penis to allow the closure of uh, uh, the, at the level of the base of the penis to the pubic symphysis periosteum. So this is a straightforward technique and you should the patient reach a good satisfaction rate. Liposuction in a patient with large overlying panus uh, is uh, the so-called uh, panulectomy with suction assisted lipectomy and uh, usually is used to remove the excess panus uh, that uh, obscure or cover the external genitalia. Uh, the technique involves uh, a, a preoperative marking that usually we do with the patient standing up because it's easier than to see uh, the area of resection. And then once uh, the panulectomy is performed, the, the excising sex skin is uh, uh, remodeling uh, and then uh, we have a very good uh, final results. Ventral phalloplasty is another way to improve the visual length. Uh, and basically, uh, there is another way to call ventral phalloplasty it is the scrotalization. Basically, this is a bird appearance that uh, the shaft of the penis may have due to the high insertion of the penoscrotal junction to the penal shaft. Uh, the technique is very straightforward, uh, basically uh, stretching the scrotum away from the penis. You do an incision along the medial rafe, and then you perform a check vertical incision parallel to the phallus about one centimeter from the phallic edge. And then basically you restore a normal condition of the shaft skin and of the scrotal skin. And uh, this is really the last uh, technique that uh, I am showing. Uh, it is the augmentation corporoplasty. This technique was described a uh, few several years ago by an Italian author, Eduardo Ostoni. And basically, uh, this, is, uh, this technique used bilateral corporal venous graft to expand the corporal girth. And uh, um, basically, you do bilateral longitudinal incision and you use the, uh, the, the venous graft basically to give uh, this uh, extension of the girth. But this is something that you can see only in the erected phase, not in the flashy states. And so again, this is suitable and to be offered only to people who are seeking for augmentation in erected states of the girth of the penis. But uh, although we have seen all this technique and there is a lot of variety things to be offered, but we need to comment that uh, still 96% of our patients that receive cosmetic procedure and have body dysmorphic disorder report worsening or non change in the symptoms. So I think this is amazing, these slides, because make think that uh, these are my last slides about my comments uh, that basically uh, we can reach uh, some uh, uh, results uh, that has always uh, a quite wide range of uh, uh, numbers. Uh, for instance, the girth uh, has a variety of techniques and has a range between 0 to 4.9. That is a huge range of results. But the complications is the most important thing, are most likely underreported. And sometimes they are really devastating. Uh, fibrosis, related dysfunction, infection, embolism, and sometimes the death of the patient may occur. So we need to be very careful when we offer this because nowadays we do not have any clinical guidelines on penal enhancement. I can tell you that we are working on this uh, on the European Society, uh, European uh, Society of Urologists or European Urology Society. Um, and uh, probably in two years time, we will have the first guidelines on this topic.
but nowadays there is nothing and for the time being this procedure should be only considered as experimental so be careful when you speak with your patient thank you very much thank you very much to uh, to all of the speakers really um this was an excellent webinar uh, getting uh, 360 degrees around the issue i think um <clears throat> We usually have only two speakers, but to cover this topic tonight, we have three. It also means that the time is actually up and, and it's nine o'clock. We won't have uh, time for the many questions. So hopefully you'll be able to answer those to the speakers at the next Congress in Rotterdam that Carlo was advertising. We hope to see you all in person there. And we hope to see you all at the next webinar on hypersexuality on October 5th. I would like to thank very much the speakers for their excellent presentations. Again, Ipsa for the support to make this possible. And first and foremost, all of the audience for making this a success. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. As I wrote in the chat, please take a few seconds to fill out the survey. And we hope to see you on the 5th of October for the next uh, Ipsa webinar. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.